Pompeii, an ancient Roman city fit for the wealthiest of citizens. But in 79 AD, that would all change as it disappeared overnight. We all know the story of Pompeii and how the eruption of Mount Vesuvius buried the city in ash. In this video, we will cover the history of Pompeii as well as the events leading up to its destruction. First, let's look into the origins of Pompeii. Who were the original settlers? According to historians, it seems very likely that the first people to settle at Pompeii, the city of Herculaneum, and other neighboring towns were the oscan speaking people. These settlers are thought to be descended from Neolithic people of the region of Campania, Italy. The location they chose was beneficial as a warm climate and volcanic rich soil made the region rich in resources. It is then not a surprise other cultures saw it the same way and sought to take control. Around the 8th century BC, the Greeks settled across the bay and fought for control of the Oscan village of Pompeii. In the 7th century, the Etruscan culture took control and remained dominant until the naval battle of Cumae in 474 BC, where the Etruscan's navy was crushed by the king of Syracuse, Hieron I. In the 5th century, a war-based tribe called the Somnites took control of the region of Campania, giving them the towns of Pompeii, Herculaneum, and Stabiae. It wasn't until the Second Somnite War that Pompeii was first mentioned by historians of the time. In 310 BC, the Somnite Wars are extensive, so the gist of it is the Somnites struck fear into the Campanians to the point they asked for Rome to solve the problem. The Somnites were a great rival for early Rome, but Rome eventually came out on top. Rome took control over all Campania and Pompeii was then in the influence of Rome. While under the control of Rome, Campania still kept its languages and governmental control. In 91 BC, the Somnites teamed up with other Italic groups and rebelled against Rome. This is likely due to Rome not granting them Roman citizenship. This revolt was called the Social War and led to Pompeii being defeated in 89 BC by the Roman general Sulla. It wasn't until 88 BC where Rome finally gave in and granted the Italic groups Roman citizenship and they all lived happily ever after. Not quite. Rome sought to punish Pompeii rebelling against them. Pompeii was made a Roman colony, which resulted in the Oscan language being replaced by Latin. Pompeii was stripped of its authority and adopted the Roman culture. By the start of the first century AD, Pompeii had become one of the most important ports of the Bay of Naples. Pompeii exported goods across the empire. Such goods included wine, olive oil, salt, and wheat for example. The city also imported goods such as spices and exotic fruit. They even imported wild animals for their arena. It's safe to say that trade greatly improved the city as Pompeii was prosperous. It had restaurants, taverns, shops, temples, an arena, baths, schools, theaters, and even brothels to name a few. The city became a favorite hotspot for many wealthy Romans. In around 59 AD, a riot broke out at a gladiatorial show in Pompeii. According to the Roman historian Tacitus, in Annals, he talked about the fights being between citizens of Pompeii and some citizens of the city of Neucralia. Tacitus said there were taunts from a group of people, which escalated into stone throwing, and then an all-out sword fight. The Pompeians were the victors, but at the cost of many lives. News of this major clash made its way to Emperor Nero, who told the Senate to look into the matter. The Senate then passed it to the consuls, which gave their findings back to the Senate. The Senate acted and banned the hosting of any sort of gladiatorial-like events in Pompeii for 10 years. The sponsor of the events and his colleagues were exiled. Now the question is, was the riot of 59 AD really caused by the games? A form of extreme sportsmanship, which is possible, or can it be related to the cultural tensions of the social war of 91 to 88 BC? Although the social war was around 150 years before the riots, it is important to point out that Necrelia never rebelled against Rome and was awarded territory that was taken from a neighboring town that was left in ruins. Tensions may have re-sparked just two years before the riot when Emperor Nero established a veteran colony in Necrelia. Seeing as Necrelia was rewarded for siding with Rome, it may have led to the riot. If you thought the riot of 59 AD was bad, the bad luck for Pompeii was just getting started. 
Mount Vesuvius was about to show the citizens of Pompeii and the surrounding region their first major warning. Around the 5th century of February in 62 AD, an earthquake that measured around 7.5 on the Richter scale struck Pompeii and the surrounding settlements. Most of the buildings were likely destroyed. Even the parts of the thick city walls collapsed. It is estimated that around 1,000 people died during this event. Damage to the aqueducts and the Sarno Bridge greatly stunted the recovery of the city. Due to the event, many people left the city. But even though it was a tough road to recovery, the people that remained pressed on. Repairs to the city were likely sped up before the visit of Emperor Nero in 64 AD. As far as the 10-year ban on the amphitheater goes, it seems Nero became more lenient after the disaster and allowed athletic events and beast hunts to continue. On the fresco, a local official and Nero were named. It is possible that the official pleaded Nero to unban the events. It is also important to point out that Nero's second wife, Pompeii, had family ties to Pompeii as her mother and her side of the family lived there. It wouldn't be much of a stretch to say that she may have persuaded him. For 16 more years, Pompeii continued to rebuild, but in August of 79 AD, it was all for nothing as Mount Vesuvius erupted. In the morning, the volcano first sent fire and ash into the air and was nothing more than a visual spectacle. The volcano then erupted around noon and blew the entire cone off the volcano, sending a cloud of pumice around 27 miles or 43 kilometers into the air. It has been estimated that kind of power is around 100,000 times stronger than the atomic bomb on Hiroshima in 1945. The ash had to come down at some point, and when it did, its density allowed it to cover Pompeii in centimeters of ash in just a couple of minutes. By this point, many Pompeians fled or sought out shelter. By around late afternoon, another explosion occurred. This time, it sent a cloud of ash and bigger rocks higher than the first eruption. Pompeii was now covered in meters of ash, which the buildings could not withstand. Around 11 p.m., the massive cloud of ash came back down like a wave. It wiped out everyone with superheated ash. The next day, Pompeii ceased to exist, buried under meters of ash. Now that we know how it happened, how did the ancient people react to the eruption? The only written account found of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius was from Pliny the Younger, a lawyer and author who wrote to Tacitus. I'll give you a simple explanation of the letters, but I highly recommend you look at them yourselves. The link to the letters are in the description below. In the two letters, Pliny the Younger describes his first-hand account of the eruption. He wrote that it happened on the 24th of August, and he was around 18 years old at the time. He was with his mother and uncle in Mycenae. His uncle seen the eruption and went to help people across the bay. He ultimately perished from the sulfur gases. Pliny's first letter to Tacitus probably was an attempt to get his uncle remembered as a hero, but looking at the second letter, it seems Pliny knew Tacitus was more interested in the catastrophic event itself and elaborated more on it. Pliny described the phases of the volcano, from giant ash clouds, to falling stones, to waves of ash spreading across the bay. This is important information as it gives us a written account of the events that took place. The ancient account of how Mount Vesuvius erupted lines up to what we know about volcanoes to this day, seeing as this is the only written account of the eruption. We really need to rely on Pliny being accurate with his account. The letters provide details of the events, but there are some problems with them. Firstly, the letters were thought to have been written around 20 years after the disaster. It is a high possibility he forgot some details. Second, we don't know if Pliny the Younger exaggerated his account to impress the historian Tacitus. We don't have the original letters of Pliny the Younger. The letters were translated into books, which were then translated into other languages, which allows words to be translated inaccurately. Funny enough, recent excavations casts more doubt on the accuracy of the letters. Researchers found an inscription on a home, which a worker was likely repairing. The inscription was of a date, 16 days before the Calents of November. This, of course, is the old Roman calendar. If we use our modern dating style, we get October 17th as the date. 
Now it's easy to say that the inscription was written in August, but scheduled for October. The reason this date matters is the fact it was faintly written in charcoal. This would suggest that the inscription was only temporary. The theory of the eruption taking place around October isn't new. There has been seasonal fruit and fire brazers found that further support the date being around October, regardless of the possible inaccuracies of the letters and whether the date of the event is correct. There were around 2,000 skeletons found in Pompeii. It is estimated around 16,000 people died overall from the eruption. This includes the other settlements like Herculaneum and Stabiae. All the death and destruction is a sad thing to have to think about, but there is a silver lining. Before the eruption in 79 AD, there are around 10,000 to 20,000 people living in Pompeii. That being said, if we only found 2,000 bodies in Pompeii, it likely means 80% of the Pompeians survived. So where is the evidence of this? Stephen Tuck, a researcher at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, tracked the movement of several survivors from Pompeii and Herculaneum. Tuck made a list of family names that were unique to Pompeii and Herculaneum after the eruption. Tuck then looked for cultural ties to both cities based on their religious worship, such as the patron goddess of Pompeii, Venus. Adding that all together, we get an idea on where the refugees settled. Since the known world in ancient times wasn't as vast as what we know today, the refugees likely stayed on the southern Italian coast or settled in Naples, Ostia, Cume, and Puteoli. Tuck found there was evidence of women and freed slaves that resettled, but seeing as most of the slaves didn't have any records of their family names, they don't appear, and according to Tuck, it underestimates the number of people who survived. It turns out, Emperor Titus gave money to cities that housed the refugees. The money came from the people that died from the eruption and had no heirs. The cities then used this money to build new neighborhoods and other communal buildings. Of course, it's not a surprise that Emperor Titus took credit for the infrastructure that was created from the funds. Even still, there still can be a happy ending to all this, as the majority of citizens of Pompeii survived to live another day. Thanks for watching. I do plan on making a part two as we still haven't gotten to see the rediscovering of Pompeii in the 1700s, as well as the world famous Pompeii bodies. It definitely needs its own video, but I want to take a break of Pompeii for now and work on something else. If you liked the video, make sure to leave a like and share the video. And if you haven't already, subscribe for more history content and I'll see you guys in the next video.